right now on Close Up with The Hollywood Reporter. You know, you think of Scientology, and you, you think anybody who would be involved in that has got to be a wingnut. I met all these people who had left, and they were so smart, perceptive, empathetic. I came out this week and announced that I actually like The Bachelorette. I, I, <laughs> you see, you brought out things I've never said before. We'll hear from the filmmakers behind the year's best documentaries. Michael Moore, Where to Invade Next. Alex Gibney, Going Clear, Scientology and the Prism of Belief, and Steve Jobs, The Man in the Machine. Amy Berg, Prophet's Prey, and Janice, Little Girl Blue. Kirby Dick, The Hunting Ground. Liz Garbus, What Happened, Miss Simone. Chai Vassarelli, Maru. Hello, and welcome to Close Up with The Hollywood Reporter. I'm Stephen Galloway, Executive Editor Features. I'm Greg Kilday, Film Editor. And let's get started. Let's start with what kind of person makes a great documentary filmmaker? I think it, you have to be a workaholic. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the most labor-intensive art form there is. Absolutely. I really do. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, if I have uh, students or interns, you know, that's the first thing I tell them. If you're not a workaholic, don't get into the business. There's a relentlessness yes. to it. Yeah. Yeah. Real tenacity. Are you all anti-authority? Probably. <laughs> Michael? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I went to Catholic school, so that <laughs> auto automatically, I think, makes you anti-authority. <laughs> I think, I, think um, I don't like to ghettoize uh, documentary filmmaking from filmmaking. I think we're filmmakers. I don't like the word documentarian. We don't call Scorsese a fictionitarian. <laughs> uh, you know, we make movies. And I would like people to see us probably as just as filmmakers. And um, some filmmakers choose fiction as their avenue, and some choose nonfiction. And you, and we choose nonfiction. But you don't fictionalize the factual truth, and that is the difference, isn't it? Yeah, well, what that, is the, yeah, yeah, that is that is the difference, right? But, the facts are the facts. Hope you know. Yeah, the but we are, are the facts, but not necessarily always in the same order as you would predict them. I mean, I think you know. Anytime you make a film, you make a film that has a certain shape and you've chosen certain moments to emphasize or not. But we're dealing with the facts and we're dealing with real people, not actors. But I think there's a lot of shaping that goes on, that's to be right. honest. Yeah. We're storytellers. I mean, that's right. Yeah, yeah we're, we're storytellers. Story and we look for structures in our film that move people and pull people through and keep them engaged the same way that all filmmakers do, documentary and fiction filmmakers. Um, and I think that um, if the films are successful, they make you passionate. They make you see something about yourself that you sort of weren't fully necessarily aware of. They make you moved to be engaged. And I think that that's the best effect any film can have. I've always thought that I was shaking people up, but now I want to go at it more, and I want to go at it more deliberately, and I want to go at it coldly. I want, I want to shake people up so bad that when they leave a nightclub where I've performed, I, I just want them to be to pieces. How would you say doc films have evolved in that, like in the new journalism, you're using narrative storytelling techniques a lot of the time to bring your films to life. That's different from the old-fashioned traditional doc of he said, she said. But that, I don't know if those old-fashioned traditional docs are really, I mean, you know, Errol Morris was using innovative storytelling techniques, you know, 30 years, 20, mm -hmm. 30 years ago. Years. You know, I, don't, I wouldn't think about Gimme Shelter as a, you know, he said, she said. I mean, I think there's been a long tradition of unbelievably amazing storytelling in this genre. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Actually, if you look at Gimme Shelter, it's a really interesting movie because it's in the cinema verite tradition, so-called, but it's really structured like a murder mystery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see the murder at the beginning, you wind back to find out how it happened, and you get to the murder again. Huh. But several of you put your, have really put yourself in your movies, Michael in, in particular. Why? I asked myself that. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I, uh, when I made my first film, you know, I didn't go to film school, I didn't know really much about it, and this uh, filmmaker, was helping me and he was showing me how to use the camera and the equipment and mm -hmm. and uh, he suggested that maybe I, I try being in the cam in the frame a little bit but you know I mean I'm let, let's just be honest I mean n nobody of my ilk 
wants to see themselves blown up 50 feet on a screen. <laughs> so it's kind of like, it was a little shocking the first time I saw it. I didn't like it then, I don't like it now. I do it, <clears throat> I don't wanna make it sound too noble, <laughs> but I really see myself as, I, I'm just a stand in for the audience. I'm a way for the audience to cathartically live through me as I go into places of power or troubled situations. And my hope is that the audience will just see me as the, themselves. I, I like it. I yeah. just want to say, I like it. I mean, I think, I mean, you one like of the things about that- You like looking at me blown up 50 I feet? I do, I do. And I, 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 like your, your <laughs> I liked your influence on documentary filmmaking. I really did. I know, and Roger and me should be in that, right. though, these films that we're talking about, which are, you know, the, the best stories mm -hmm. told in the nonfiction form right. Right. that we've all been- But Kobe, you don't put yourself in your films. I did once. This film is not yet rated. Oh, yeah. um, but everyone puts themselves in their films. Right. It's just a matter of adding a personality. I mean, it's before we even start a film, we're thinking about why we're drawn to it and what questions That's we're true. going to ask. And, and in the edit room. In the edit room, the, completely The film is framed. essentially written yeah. in the edit room yeah. by yes. you and right. all of yeah. us. Right. Right. But Alex, in going clear, you're clearly the investigative voice going right. through this film. Whereas in, in your films, you use other voices. How do you decide whether to become the first person narrator or not? Well, sometimes for me, I, I find narration to be efficient. You know, yeah. instead of burning off the attention of the audience by using like four or five different interview subjects to create a point of exposition, narration can be efficient. But I don't ever want it to be the voice of God. It should be the voice of Alex, you know, because that's more honest in terms of laying it out. So you hear me behind the camera asking questions. And in that film in particular, there was also a metaphor going on which was a, a kind of self-mocking metaphor about how the interview process is a little bit like Scientology auditing, except I don't yeah. use the E-meter. <laughs> yeah. I like, is, I like hearing it? your voice, though. I, I like, <laughs> even though we can't see you. I know, you know, it's, it's, uh, you feel the there's presence. something, there's a real presence in your voice, and it's in, um, and we trust it. Uh, you know, we know you've done your homework, and we know that you're going somewhere, and you're taking us on that ride. And both of you, you're holding our hands through territories that are challenging and often misunderstood, and you're helping us through. But I think that without that first-person narrator, as Amy said, we're making those choices using those voices. In my film, Nina Simone is essentially a narrator of her own story. How much audio. were you restricted by the fact that her daughter is one of the executive producers. No, we weren't restricted at all. I mean, one of the things that I think when you're making a film about a biographical figure when there are still people alive involved with them is you say to them at the beginning, like, I need my space. This is how I work. Like, I'm very happy to show you the film before it goes to the entire world as a courtesy, but that's mm -hmm. really the extent of it. Right. And she was amazing. I mean, I know mm -hmm. you probably worked with the Joplin family in yeah. the same way. And I have to say, Lisa Simone Kelly was more able to contain her own emotional reactions and than I would have been in a film about my mother. And so this, it was wonderful, yeah. actually. And this is why it takes so long, I think, for music documentaries, is because we often are you know, trying to negotiate our space with the people who hold the, hold the estates. And I mean, you have well, to get- What do the Joplin estate insist on? Well, they are notorious for being difficult in terms of the, you know, the fictional projects that have been trying to get off the ground. But with me, they trusted my vision. I've been working with them for eight years now, and they trusted my vision from the beginning when I made the first trailer. But there were just so many complications in just trying to get the film off the ground. I mean, we have so many other issues that we have to deal with, with music and archive and existing contracts. And those but family members, they just they, have to take that leap of faith do. with you. Otherwise, they it doesn't do. work. If, yeah. if they're on you all the time, the yeah. film won't happen. It won't It'll happen. It'll just die. Yeah. And that's so, true with any. was kind of an interesting it, yeah. case with this, where yeah. Jimmy is one of the directors as well as one of the subjects of the film. Um, and initially he wasn't so present in the film and it was something that became very clear that it was important for the story that he had to, he had to kind of give of himself and actually you know, appear in the film despite it being the last thing he really wanted to do. It's all about climbing the cracks. We don't see any here. <laughs> We'd hit these totally blank sections of rock and I was sure there wasn't anywhere else to go. But then Jimmy or Conrad would launch into the void. It's this line between keeping a distance and really getting involved. And, and, and where, where do you cross line? You ended up marrying your subject. I did. Um, I did. I don't regret it. It's a great decision. <laughs> You're now pregnant with your second baby. Yes. Which might appear in the middle of this round table. That's true. How did that man take the process of making that film? Well, I had always been a big believer of church and state. 
Mm -hmm. um, if someone wanted a date, I did not want to make a film with them. But with this material, like I got involved with the film before Jimmy and I became romantically involved. And it, I mean, we fell in love. And however, in terms of the filmmaking, it was interesting because he, he, I wasn't on the mountain, he was on the mountain. And he had this vision for a film and he wanted to tell the story of his mentor, Conrad Anker, and this kind of incredible journey they go on together. And as a documentary filmmaker, I knew how to do that. So our working relationship was actually quite special and I think it made it, it's also why our marriage is, works because we are a good team. We're very different. We come from it at, um, at different sides. He really trusts me in terms of the storytelling. Um, I had a similar complicated relationship with Charlton Heston. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've never spoken about it publicly. <laughs> <laughs> you <can> tell them. <clears throat> yeah, so I had to keep saying Chuck, you know, yeah. we're doing a movie here. <laughs> keep it professional. Well, I mean, that, that's the flip side. I mean, there are the movies where you become close to your subjects. Or there are the movies where your subjects won't open the door to you. Uh, how do you decide to keep persevering on a film when those doors are put up in front of you? Alex. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's happened to me a number of times. I've gotten, I've been in movies where people have given me all the access in the world and some of them have gotten none. For example, in with Julian Assange and We Steal Secrets about mm -hmm. WikiLeaks. But actually, what I usually find is that when your road is blocked and it ends up causing you to take a more interesting mm -hmm. path than you otherwise right. might have done. Right. In that case, I ended up focusing much more on Chelsea Manning, who had been left out of the story. Everybody was talking about WikiLeaks, but Chelsea Manning right. was the leaker. Yeah. And Julian Assange was the publisher. But I think that's the great thing about documentaries because, as Michael says, they're written in the cutting room. Mm -hmm. So your journey is, is the interesting part of the path. And if you allow yourself to be surprised and then change as you go, then anything's possible. What surprised you in making the film about Scientology? And how did you change your mind about that? What surprised me was, you know, you think of Scientology, and you, you, you think anybody who would be involved in that has got to be a, you know, a wingnut. I met all these people who had left, who were formed the core of the film, and they were so smart, perceptive, empathetic. And you realize, and so for me then, the surprise was it ended up being a kind of journey into understanding the prison of belief, really for all of us, that all of us can be captured by a kind right. of prison of belief and fall into a belief system that suddenly um, persuades us to do things that we might otherwise find appalling. But aren't we all, to some degree, prisoners of our beliefs, whatever they happen to be? I think we are. Uh, you know, you said you brought up in the Catholic Church. Mm. Uh, once a Catholic, always a Catholic. Mm. How's yeah. that going? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I thought a lot about this since seeing Alex's film, because Mormons, Scientologists, these are very, very, very small religions. And very easy to either make fun of, you know, because they seem so strange. But because it's the dominant culture, Christianity, we don't think of it as being strange that this piece of bread is actually the body of mm -hmm. Jesus or that we're drinking his blood. Right. Scientology has not similar, but its own bizarro right. thing, as I think most faiths do. Mm -hmm. and, and it's probably not really the faith itself. The, the original texts of all the faiths are pretty good. They all say that you should treat the poor well and be good to your neighbor and all of that. It's, it's, the, it's the institutionalization of these faiths as, it, as they... Well, in point of fact, in the Catholic Church, most of what we receive as doctrine today, I also was raised Catholic, um, you know, was made up at some point in time right. by a bunch of guys sitting around a table. It's like, how do we work this in? Like, right. Right. it's a guy, but he was born of a woman who was married, but she was a virgin. How are we gonna work that out, you know? But- um, People love a good magic right. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's, right. That's right. Out of the blue, one day I received this envelope with an invitation to join the Sea Project. It was, completely confidential. I wasn't to tell anyone about it. And I was so ecstatic. Here was a chance to work with Hubbard. And I signed, yes. I was on my way to the greatest adventure in my life. I mean, Amy and Kirby, you made documentaries about sexual abuse in the church. How much influence do you think you've had in 
creating that narrative? Well, I think with Twist of Faith, I focused on just the experience of one man who had been abused and how it impacted himself, his family, his, uh, his, his relationship with his wife, his uh, community, and his church. And I actually think that had a huge influence. You know, the Boston Globe had just recently broken that story, but people were still saying, I kept hearing over and over, well, somebody's been abused, but why don't they just get over it 10, 20, 30 right. years ago? <laughs> And I think, you know, Twist of Faith did help answer that question, yeah. is that this is something they're called survivors, they're with it for right. the rest of their lives. And right. And I think something yeah. that's interesting when you see in a lot of these films, actually not mine included, is that investigative journalism, actually that space has been ceded to documentary filmmakers mm -hmm. because there's not the same kind of investigative journalists that we saw with Cy Hirsch and Bob Woodward right, right, right. and that generation. And I think these guys are doing that now and they're given the time and the leeway and it does create social change. Does it? Absolutely. Because, uh, you know, you're not seeing something broadcast on a television show that's been given access to millions. And I think... Well, actually, several, but are you, you, often, you are but often. Several yeah. of you have fought have these films shown in movie theaters rather than television. Well, there, there has shown to be in an impact. Places. When yeah. we started making, when we made our Catholic films, Deliver Some Evil was after Twist of Faith, I remember they used to have the sexual abuse victim, the face was blurred and it said sexual abuse victim right. on the news. I mean, that's not how it's being reported yeah. today. Right. And I that's think true. that all that's the voices, yeah, that have come forward. Yeah. But to your point about whether these films have effect, I mean, you go around this table and see that each of these individuals, the films that they've done have educated have educated millions of people. Uh, I mean, his film about uh, rape and campus rape, this is very much a part of an, uh, an awareness that, and people are going after this. So and it's, the, and it's the goal is social change. Why do you want your film shown in movie theaters? My goal is in social change. You know, rather than, no. than in front of a big audience. No, my, my goal is to, is to make a great movie. What's and to have it seen by movie? audiences in a movie theater. And to give people a chance on a Friday or Saturday night after working hard all week uh, to, to pay unwind. 10 bucks or whatever and watch something that they're, that's going to make them think, it's going to make them laugh, it's going to make them cry, it's going to This is also have... something that's created by the industry. Like, whether or not these movies are seen on television, like, we love our movies being seen in theaters, right. and I love seeing movies. I've seen all of these guys' movies in theaters, actually, mm -hmm. and I think that it's the greatest way to receive a wonderful story as Absolutely. an audience member and be moved and be changed. It's also wonderful for them to go and go on television and reach millions and millions and millions right. of people as these films have. I, I think this is, an in, this is an inside baseball thing that doesn't actually apply in the real world. Kirby, is your goal social change? I wouldn't say it's social change. I mean, certainly awareness. I think when any filmmaker makes a film about a, you know, a real social problem, they want the film to have impact. I mean, they mm -hmm. see it. But I mean, it's not, it's not like I'm targeting specific right. social change. It's more like I'm putting this out there right. to help change the discussion around this. And when I say that I'm not doing this for social change, I mean, this is me saying this. Right. Uh, obviously, I care deeply about these course, issues. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I know first, and, if I don't get the art right, mm -hmm. the cinema, the That's filmmaking right. right, whatever I feel strongly and passionately about politically, it's gonna fail yeah. if I don't first make a, a good and great movie. Right. Yes. And, and so I always try to put that ahead of the, the politics. Mm -hmm. The politics will do well if I've made a great movie. If I've, if I've not, then I'm gonna actually probably hurt the politics. So that's why I, when I answer your question that way, I, if that's all I cared about, I would be a political activist or I would be r running a, a grassroots group or running for office. And the movies wouldn't have Make humor and fun. Right. I mean, you know, and I think in the case of Nina Simone, it's a film about a woman who lived, you know, some time ago, but her her struggle is totally resonant now. But I'm, I'm trying to tell you a moving story of an individual that hopefully you see yourself in and that you're passionate about. But at the same time, you're looking at the, you know, Black Lives Matter. You're looking at all these things in a different way. And Can I disagree, though, with something that you said about the... No. <laughs> he cannot disagree. Next oh, yes, question. Yeah. <laughs> Go. I don't think it's inside baseball to have this discussion about uh, theaters versus television. Uh, I've done both. I, I had two TV series. Uh, I love TV. Uh, I watch a lot of it. I, I came out this week and announced that I actually like The Bachelorette. I mean, I, I, I you know, oh, I, I find it an interesting show. Yes, but we'll get into that some other. But, but John has uh, lost all respect. Yeah, for I know. I, I, well, I know. I <laughs> so just, these, these, see, you brought out things I've never said before. But, I, but what I want to say about this is that I think that it, it does matter. The, to me, a movie is meant to be seen in the dark with strangers on a big screen. And I know that the audience that's watching it, that will watch it on TV or on an iPhone, yeah. are gonna experience it a different Absolutely. way. Oh. And for the social issue, the politics of it, I have a better chance with, I think, a, a thousand people who see it in a movie theater 
because that's an active thing. You have to get a babysitter. You have to leave the house. You have to spend money. Right. It's an active thing. And, and TV is so passive, and there's so many other things going well, on. Well, aren't and the people who are going to pay $10 to see your movie basically the ones who agree with it in the first place? No, that's, for me at least, no. That's why I've been lucky enough to have the box office I've had, because I've been able to cross over from the church to the left. My films are shown in shopping malls in Minnesota and Michigan and Kansas and Idaho. They're, and all, they're all liberals in Minnesota and Idaho. <laughs> they're, they're everywhere. <laughs> Alex, what do you think of what he said? I think that uh, it's a blended experience, too. I also make my films for the big screen, but I'm perfectly happy for people to watch them on television. In fact, in my own viewing experience, it's cheaper and sometimes more satisfying to watch it on my big screen TV at home. And, by the way, the theatrical experience for an independent filmmaker is usually a terrible business deal. <laughs> terrible. Yeah. Um, so it's blended. I mean, I think the point is what we're celebrating here is cinema. And, you know, if I were to watch my film at the Ziegfeld, great. <laughs> Both of you have been vilified for your documentaries and, and several other people here. Yours has been criticized. Chai, Yours hasn't, you're, mm. you're lucky. <laughs> What's well, the we personal the, price the that you've paid screen. to be documentary filmmakers and to make these films? Well, I think, I mean, you, you sort of have to expect this. I mean, when you make a strong film, I mean, if, if you don't get that reaction, mm. it, perhaps you haven't made the film strong enough. You know, I mean, I, it, it doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, you're, you're going into a, a territory that, you know, with sexual assault, for example, this is something that people want to cover up. They want to do everything they can. Society, individuals, schools, you, you name it, they want to cover it up. So I, I think if, if I haven't, you know, made that impact where it's, it's causing people to respond and even to come at me, I really haven't told the whole truth. How much, when you're taking a film out that does hit a contentious issue, I mean, a number of you have active social media presences. Mm -hmm. Do you then have to do months worth of follow-up with a film as a kind of ambassador about that film? Sure. Yeah, Always, sure that's part do. of the job. Yeah. Yeah. It's a we want to do, yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we yeah. want to do that. And I think that's very yeah. important. You engage. Right. And, and even, you know, if there's hostility, and I certainly have experienced a, a good bit, though, Michael, I think uh, people... I wish I just got hostility. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> I, uh, no death threats. Is, yeah, well, no, I like, death threats are great, too. Because one thing I've learned is that the, the person who wants to hurt you does not send you a note in right. advance. That's so right. the, the, the email, the death threats are great. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the <laughs> half a dozen assaults and attempts on my life, wow. including uh, a man who built a fertilizer bomb to plant under our home to blow it up. And he went to, he went to prison, and, and the others who assaulted me with knives and billy clubs or whatever else they've had. Mm -hmm. And I was in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and a really nicely dressed man in a three-piece suit comes out of the Starbucks and sees me, and he, he just turned purple, and the vein mm -hmm. started bulging. I call it the Limbaugh vein. You know, it's like mm -hmm. after they've had three hours of listening to Rush. And he takes the lid off his hot scalding coffee and throws it in my face. And only because I had this security guy with me, he saw this happening, he couldn't stop it. He put his face in front of mine, took the hit, got second degree burns, we had to take him to the hospital, but not before he took the guy down on the sidewalk and handcuffed him. But yeah. after my Oscar speech in Fahrenheit 9-11, I've lived a number of years in this kind of horrible situation. Are you afraid? Well, yeah, I'm afraid. yeah, of course. I mean, I reached a certain point where I had to just stop being afraid and I, get rid of the security, and, you know, hey, I'm in my 50s. I've lived a good life. Uh, you know, nobody will say I didn't make a contribution, and if it's going to happen today, it happens today. And then things have been fine since, so, you know. It's a funny thing that sometimes happens when you're outspoken and very public about it. It gives you a peculiar kind of protection. Not always, right. but it gives you a peculiar kind of protection because... Um, you're being out front. You're not hiding. Right. Oh, we That's deal with true. Scientology, or in your case, the Warren Jeffs Church. Yeah. Uh, did you have to take any kind of security? Did you have a sense you were being pursued at all while you were making I those I had a scenes? private detective, and he was carrying a gun. I mean, I, I didn't know what I was going to get into when I stepped into Colorado City. It was... You know, the minute we kind of entered the premises, we were being followed by the God Squad, these guys in these, you know, huge Suburbans throwing water bottles at us and locking us into areas. When, when the end of the world was coming, Warren had everybody gather out in this field and wait for the end to come. And they came out here at like six in the morning 
anticipating being lifted up and ushering in the millennium. And when it never happened, about six at night, Warren came out and told them that God had forsaken them because they were not righteous enough. I mean, I think that we all do this, like going back to what Michael said, we're storytellers. I think we all kind of get a hunch about something and we like, we're empathetic people and we walk into a room and I'm not thinking about the Cineplex when I think about the next film I'm gonna make. We're all just interested in a story and we start, we get pulled into it and then we become spokespeople for issues that, I don't know if, you know, did you wanna become the spokesperson, you know, against Scientology when you went into it or did you wanna- No, I, I was making a film know? that was about right. much more than Scientology, right. to be right. honest, but Scientology, you know. <laughs> they gave you that out. Gave you that out. Gave me that opportunity, yeah. Yeah. But he has a, you have a nuanced approach to this too. And the, for instance, John Travolta in your film, mm -hmm. um, and, and I've worked on a film with him and he's yeah. one of the nicest people sure. you'll, right. you'll meet in Hollywood. Right. Um, as is a, a Tom Cruise and Kirstie Alley. These are really nice people. And, and that's why I've never really wanted to get into, I don't care what they believe in, but but he shows, Alex shows in his film that John is a victim as a much victim, as he yeah. is. And does, and does the right thing totally too, right. to help the woman. Isn't there a danger sometimes, and, and perhaps I felt this with, with both of your films, that they, they fall into agitprop? Like right. that's, a, that's a bad thing or what? <laughs> I mean, so agitprop, you mean in the sense that we're prop. engaging our audiences to have an emotional or a, or a, a, a mental reaction to in the uh, sense that it perhaps isn't the full complex But this is the truth. issue where we talk about what the full truth is because yeah. we're all telling stories. You know, right. we're not making Wikipedia pages on our subjects. We're right. out there to tell a story about a subject that we care passionately about. And of right. course, there are going to be many ellipses in this story because we have 100 minutes and right. we're trying to entertain. And I think this idea of the full truth is like, is kind of something that, that kind of comes back to us all, a lot but is never asked, again, like of a, of a fiction film. It's a little bit of a misunderstanding of the genre, I think, actually. Right. Well, and I also uh, think, uh, I mean, let's, getting... Let's, Charlie, you going to say something? Oh, no, I, I mean, that would be my question, is would you ask this of a fiction filmmaker? I think likewise with journalists. Well, like yes, with, you, if you they're publishing from a You certain... would ask it of the movie Truth. Is Truth the truth about Dan Rather? Is Steve Jobs the truth about Steve Jobs? No, it's an artist's vision yeah, we, and of, of a cultural... Well, these are, yeah. It's yeah. perfectly it's legitimate it's to ask those questions. It's painting but... of, of, a, of his wife, the true picture of his wife. No, it's a vision, it's art. Do you think right. Shakespeare's Henry V was, uh, was factually correct about Henry V? <laughs> you can the see fifth? we're getting really... <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm, yeah. but I'm serious, though. <laughs> Is Henry V wrong? Because right. it's Shakespeare's interpretation of a story he wanted to tell using an actual character from history. Yes, or paintings or, or portraits of art. You make the argument that Shakespeare was a propagandist for Elizabethan England and totally distorted our perception of history. My argument would be, as documentary filmmakers, you do have a high obligation to the truth. Absolutely. Well, I think we, we all feel it. Well, I mean, yeah, we I feel it. Yeah, we all feel it. That's why we... But the truth is, as you said, complicated and layered. And the film I would make about Scientology would be different than the film he made about Scientology. That's right. But it doesn't mean that, that his isn't true or mine wouldn't be true. Right. right. That's, that's, facts and truth are two different right. things. And I think that that's, that's, that's part of the, what we were talking about earlier in terms of being honest about the authorship. These that's are right. authored films. They're not meant to be lists of facts. That's the phone book. That's right. So if they're authored films, then every viewer should be able to take that into account, which is why I think, you know, to Michael's point earlier, they should be considered as films, not just documentaries. Right. They're authored works every bit as much as a fiction film is an authored work. And, right. yeah. but and I think we the... trust our audiences to understand that we're telling them a story. Like we trust them to understand that this is Alex's version or this is mm -hmm. Amy's version of Janice. And I mean, I think that they, they do understand that, that you're right. being taken on a ride and you're watching an artist Absolutely. tell a story. Right. Because I use, I, mean, I use satire and, and humor. So my documentary begins with me saying that I had a secret meeting with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Now, I'm assuming the audience knows just, you know, <laughs> smart people you will get... You had me there. That, <laughs> 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 yeah, you know, we know... We your enemies we all, close, right? Yes, yeah, right, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. If they would actually see me, I would go to talk to them. But it begins with essentially something that is true, which is my fantasy, is if I could have an hour with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I actually do have a few things I'd like to share with them. And, right. and so I begin the film with that, with that truth. It's a fantasy, but it's real, too because I really want that hour with them. 
Right, and I think Kirby. there's a different definition. Um, it went like when we're talking about like the biopic. I think it opens things up a little bit more because you don't have a, a person like Janis Joplin is not around to answer these mm. questions. Nina Simone not around to answer. And I think when you're dealing with an archive, you do kind of have to choose which path you're gonna go. And you know, there are lots of different versions That's of right. Janice's yeah. story, but the yeah. one that I chose was, you know, it was just how to get from the beginning to the end of her life in a way that felt emotional and comprehensive to me. But I'm sure that, as you just said, if you made a, a film about Scientology, Michael, it would be a completely different story. What ethical issues do you deal with in your films? I mean, did you feel an ethical obligation? To Janice? Yeah. God, it, it was, Yes, of course. Um, I I fell in love with her. You know, I fell in love with her even more by the end than the beginning. And I found myself very protective about certain parts of her life. But I constantly was challenging myself to, am I ta am I doing a disservice by not putting a yes. certain thing in the yeah. film? Mm -hmm. Because you know, there is as long as you're as long as you're telling the truth, your truth from the beginning to the end. I don't think. It's, I, I didn't want to exploit her. I didn't want to, you know, highlight every little indiscretion of Janice Well, that's Joplin, right. And also, she's you, complicated. You she know? has millions and millions of people who love Absolutely. her. And the same with Nina Simone, who are moved by the music Absolutely. and who firm it's part of their lives. So you are making all these decisions all the time right. because you want that love to continue. Right. You love the subject so deeply. Right. They become part of your family. Absolutely. And I think that... You know, the reasons that these films are being talked about and seen is because there's something that we're recognizing as a truth that's resonating. Did you change the path of your story as you started? Well, yeah, I mean, the archival discovery process of is course, long and ongoing. And mm -hmm. as we hear more and more things from her, you know, her talking about domestic violence, you know, all of these things, of course, I'm listening to Nina in where mm -hmm. I go with the story. Right. Of course, I have a lens. I was very interested in her politics, you know, and I have a lens and I'm sort of digging into that more than another filmmaker would have. Right, and there are checks and balances as well. I mean, we all have people that we count on. We have producers. Alex produced the Janice film and, and people that were in her life that... I wanted to show the film to and make sure that you know there were that I was getting the right Janice. There, there's a purist and purest view of documentaries that you should never restage or reshoot a scene. I wonder what 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 is it? Did you restage things for the for your for your mountaineering film? No, because you Meru? couldn't. I no, mean, no one in their right mind would return to Meru to try to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and it was well, the last John Krakauer thing. might. Let's yes, just, yes. You know. Well, John would have loved to. <laughs> like, but John is into that type of suffering, and um, so that was actually an interesting craft issue for us. Which I'm curious when we see footage of avalanches. Are those the actual avalanches that? The, the men were in, or did you have to resort to other footage? Well, this is an interesting issue between Jimmy and myself, where I was like, there were three camera crews on that shoot. No one shot the actual avalanche <laughs> that you almost died in. I was like, what sort of filmmakers make. do you think you guys are? Um, and then they all calmly explained to me that if you what actually get like down <laughs> two minutes earlier, yeah. you've got this much higher chance of finding someone alive, and so try oh, no. chill out. Um, oh, no. But that those avalanches are from a guy who specializes in avalanches. He actually stages them. Like he sets them. One thing I, I don't, think the, one thing I don't do is I, I don't I don't do a second take. So if I'm doing if I'm interviewing somebody or I'm talking to somebody, if the sound guy says, "Oh, we, we, they didn't come through very well," yeah. or something happened with the camera, the battery, and yeah. if you go back and try to get a civilian, a non-actor, now to repeat. That's and right. try to That's get right. what you just yeah. got, which was so great. Yeah, it doesn't feel authentic. It doesn't feel authentic. Yeah. And you can ask the question but I, I go back. I, I, I mean, sometimes yeah. redirect. I come redirect. back to that. Yes, yeah, exactly. I just up on it a long time ago. Sure. I just, <laughs> well, I don't redirect and say try to say it this way, but right. I come back around, and particularly if I feel they haven't been entirely honest. I may come back huh. around to that subject later on yeah. and ask a question yeah, that's it, roughly that's, the same. Yeah, yeah it's a way of corroborating. It's a really good way of corroborating. But you also learn something in the first answer, and you're thinking about it as you're doing the interview and how it relates to your film, how it relates to right. their experience. And, and then you, you're sort of prepared to answer, answer the question in a different way. Absolutely. You know, maybe come at it in a completely different way with a completely different tone. And then you get, it opens up in a completely you know, new way totally. for you. So. Well, Kirby, in your film, in The Hunting Ground, I mean, you're following these women activists, but you really start the film by going back in time and showing them arriving at school. Right. Now, obviously, you had to stage that for, for your film. Well, what I wanted to show in The Hunting Ground is that, you know, I mean, the love that people have for going to college, that how, how much thrill there is, because there's that much more betrayal when, they, when they're assaulted and their school doesn't do something. So I focused, you know, it went back even further and focused on their, you know, these YouTube videos that we found of, the, of them getting acceptance letters. And, it, it, it's, that opening so sets the tone that I've, I've heard people crying 
at that, what I thought was very comedic opening, because it, it just reminds people of how much school means to them mm -hmm. or to their children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in your time at UNC, how, how many students came to you and said they'd been assaulted? Um, yeah, it's hard to put a number, it's hard to put a number on it, so at least 100. And of the 100, how many of the perpetrators were removed from campus? From what I remember, no one was expelled during that time. So these guys could just get away with it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And people could commit it repeatedly. Is there a subject that you haven't been able to make that's close to your heart that for whatever reason you couldn't get the money, you couldn't get cooperation? I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I know you, you took a great run at it, but, you know, the NRA, I've, I'm, I, you yeah, know, I'm yeah. sure we all think about making a movie That's on right, this, Ken. and and it's just, you know, I look, and they're so successful. They're mm -hmm. so politically successful. Let's all make one together. Yeah. That's right. A you team. Should, you should make Michael's that movie. knocking on no, the door. No, I, I've already done it. You <laughs> should, you should, it needs, <laughs> seriously. It needs, it needs to be track. kept, kept to be yes. made. Keep on Because, making. you know, yeah. nothing's changing. It's Maybe it so is up to crazy. documentary filmmakers to take, all of us right. to take another run at it. Do you think you can really change anything significant just with one film? I made a film called Taxi to the Dark Side, mm. and yeah. ultimately, you know, it ended up being adopted as required viewing by the Army JAG School. Oh, wow. And that's something I wow. wouldn't have expected when mm -hmm. I started to make a film about how the Bush administration had institutionalized that's torture. Right. So. Yeah. You, can easy, you can look at Twist of Vase, Deliver Us from Evil, Max Mia Culpa. Mm. Sorry, Mia Max <laughs> But I mean, if you look at what happened, people started coming out and speaking publicly yes. after your film. I had a priest come out and talk on camera to me. The Pope resigned after his film. I mean, it's like, it well, took yeah. 10 <laughs> years though. You know what I mean? I, I don't think, I think Enron was very hard to understand until his documentary came out. Mm -hmm. and, and it's the definitive explanation mm -hmm. of, of greed gone amok. And really the, it's the early warning signs of what happened eventually with the crash of 08. In his in his documentary, yeah. I think we can all point to things in our films yeah. where, I'm in in a, a film of mine from the '90s, the big one, resulted yeah. in Phil Knight of Nike uh, ending child labor in his Indonesian shoe factories. Right. They and have an big impact, things, but and then sometimes the, also the small things. I mean, there are people who empathize with people that they didn't think they could, and they right. would, and they go sit on right. juries and they go talk to pe their neighbors, and they're thinking about them Absolutely. in different ways about what structural uh, situations put them where they are and made them who they are. So it's also like that. You know, there's the big and then and there's this, the, the micro, the micro. Yeah. That's and sometimes is, they're like yeah. time bombs. They're like psychic time bombs. You, there's an image from a film that slowly resonates in people's heads over time, and it becomes that moment that may end up changing their minds or causing them to see things differently. But you create that kind of sacred space where people can enter and think about mm -hmm. things in a way that they didn't expect. I've been accused of being, of being responsible for people eating less rabbit meat. I mean, <laughs> seriously, I've actually read this. <laughs> but I, well, I, I just big. don't know why you would, <laughs> I don't it know why you would do it unless you thought you could change something. Mm. I right. mean, I don't know why you would un like suffer through this process right. unless you thought we you could change it. one. I mean, is we it, do uh, love it. Is it but suffering? It's we love to suffer. But I mean, even what, what, on Meru, what, what, it's like these what, why three. Why was, why was Meru suffering? Well, I think that it's just oh, this process. You fell in love. Two babies like I mean, one, like their physical endurance. But, you know, even like a film like Meru, where all three of them are environmentalists like they have a very strong connection to the outdoors mm -hmm. and anyone who sees the film looks at the outdoors differently and that is a change and is there one single film documentary or otherwise that changed each of your lives i think that for me the most influential film was la jolie may the chris marker film because it mm. was a way of looking mm. at a very important political issue but looking around it and looking at the human stories around it well, I saw The Atomic Cafe in 1983, and it's the first time I saw a documentary about a serious subject that used humor. It's the oh. duck and cover films from the 50s put together into a, a documentary. Yeah. And then on the flip side of that, uh, Hearts and Minds, back in the 70s, mm -hmm. uh, was the definitive film about Vietnam that I encourage everyone to see. It was, it was very powerful. It moved me. They won the Oscar. He got booed off the stage because he read a telegram from the head of North Vietnam to the American people saying we want peace. Yeah, so those were early, those were early yeah. for me. I, I remember seeing Breaking the Waves and I mm. just felt zero <clears throat> removal between me and the, I was in the room with Emily Watson and I just remember feeling her pain in such a deep way and I felt like that that made me want to make documentaries. Mm. Wow. Fiction. Wow. And it, not one movie, I mean, but 
Um, certainly the 60s verite filmmakers were so influential to me when I first went into film. Especially what's interesting is they're working under much more difficult conditions with you know, uh, equipment that's much harder to use. So, right. But it's, it's interesting, like you said, you know, if there's an obstacle, it actually allows you to be more creative. And, and certainly there's a million obstacles in making documentaries. So I think this unpredictability of making the film and then of editing it is what is really drawing audiences to this. This is why I think documentary films are so successful, is they, they understand the narrative arc in a feature film, but no one, including the filmmaker, knows quite what the arc is. Well, I think there were so many. I would, I mean, I think Barbara Koppel's Harlan County film. Yes, I mean, so also yeah. as a female filmmaker, doing that film was yeah, incredibly sure. inspiring to me. I was making The Farm in the mid '90s, and um, her film was something I held. It gave me a lot. It gave me inspiration. Yeah. And she, as a filmmaker mentor, mm -hmm. has been mm -hmm. extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Alex, Thin Blue Line was a tremendous, yeah. liber yeah. tremendously liberating film because it meant that you could do anything, mm -hmm. uh, but in the service of a truth. I mean, he he got that guy off of death row. So he was investigating, but also by using fiction techniques within the context of a documentary, proved that there is a different approach to truth that you can take as a documentarian that can mm. liberate us all. So I mean, maybe that was the most influential for me. I mean, right now, Alex, you seem to be going back and forth between, for lack of a better word, political subjects and then the various biographical films you made with Steve Jobs and Armstrong. What, what attracts you to those men? Is it because they're all flawed characters in some way? I don't know. That's a that's a question for the critics. I'm not sure exactly why. I mean, I'm interested in abuses of power, and a lot of the subjects of my films tend to be people who are close to power in one way or another. Uh, right, Alex, you kind of represent a filmmaker who often has many films going, whereas, Michael, you seem to be taking several years now to make a film. Why has it been so long since your last one? He's 20 years younger than me. <laughs> uh, well, no, I, I wrote a book uh, during, this, uh, during this time. And, uh, and I said at the end of my last film, at the end of Capitalism, A Love Story, that I was now going to wait until the people rose up out of their seats uh, to do something. And then Occupy Wall Street came along. And then I felt I'd rather be a participant Wow. In it, and not just the poster boy for Fox News. So, so that was my own personal shift. But documentaries take all everybody here. It, it, you can do a film in four months. You could take four years. She's worked on this film for eight years. Uh, it depends on the film and depends on. on well, because uh, they do take so long, do you often have to have? a couple in the works at the same time. Yeah, I mean, we were just, I don't know if anyone read the article in IndieWire this week about the middle class of filmmaking. Did you guys happen to see that? No. I mean, there's, there is like, basically is no middle class <laughs> right. in filmmaking. I mean, it's, it's difficult. I mean, we have things that work and sometimes you get a, you hit a roadblock and you're stuck and you have to kind of find a way to Well, I mean, just make a living. I mean, yeah. just ask, the, ask yeah. the crew here, are, they, are, are these guys, are you guys union? <laughs> Are you union? Anybody union? We're not going to interrupt our round table. Yeah. Well, no, but I'm just, I'm just saying that you, you there, are work, later. there are work. No, they, well, they're part of this experience. They're we're using their something. labor <laughs> to do this product. It's, it's being a celebrity. And they can't, and they Michael. are sharing an apartment in Queens with four other people. It's, being a, it's being a celebrity an old. advantage or a disadvantage in your field of work? What is? Is being a celebrity an advantage or a disadvantage? Oh, you think I'm a celebrity? Uh, I thought he said genius. I know. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think. Yeah. Hmm, which one? <laughs> Great artist. You mean because I'm known, is it harder for me to walk into a place and it's like, here comes trouble, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, of course, it's it's more difficult, but that makes it more fun for me because yeah. then it, it's yeah. more challenging. And, and uh, I just made this film and uh, kept it completely quiet. Nobody knew I was uh, making it. And I flew right under the radar during an era of social media where that's just almost impossible. Yeah. Mm. So yes, there's a, there's a way even for me to, uh, to be able to do that. USA, yeah! I have invaded your country no. to steal your great idea. Unbelievable. Is this the great big penis competition? I love this. <laughs> I would have ketchup on everything. How has um, reality TV impacted what you do? I honestly kind of ignore it. 
which I don't know if that's possible. Well, Michael but I do, watches I do, The Bachelorette, yeah. we know. Yes, we know Michael yeah, watches I, The Bachelorette. Yeah, I watch, I watch reality yeah. TV. <laughs> but I don't think yeah. it really has, I don't know, maybe, I don't know how what you guys feel. Maybe I don't feel what? it has a tremendous interplay. I feel like, no. again, viewers understand the different codes, you know, that when they, they watch our films, they yes. you know, that they, they understand the codes that we're telling them. If his is first person, or if mine is, you know, with mm. a voice of, of the artist herself, like, they understand the codes of what kind of right. thing they're being told. Sometimes filmmakers get into trouble when they're not clear on those codes, and I think that can be a confusing thing for audience members right. and also the maybe then the trust between filmmaker your, your your bond with your audience is a little confused the public loves nonfiction. Yeah. i think yeah. if you look at the nielsen Absolutely. ratings of the top 20 shows some weeks half of those shows will be nonfiction shows right. some of them will be the bachelorette and dancing with the stars some of them will be 60 minutes people love nonfiction. the new york times book review section this sunday one third of the books reviewed were fiction two thirds were nonfiction. Mm. i would like the same treatment with <laughs> cinema in <laughs> terms of great. nonfiction cinema not being put over at the children's table at thanksgiving but but to be sitting at this table uh, even the discussion of whether or not because you film in the pat you film the the actors round table and the writers round table but there was a huge discussion as to whether or not to do the documentary round table as part of the video uh, series right. that that uh, that you're having and it's it's just it's a constant struggle that I think mm-hmm. all of us face whether we are well known or not to to get nonfiction in the forefront because we know the audience loves nonfiction isn't this a basically a, a golden age of documentaries yes. though so but do you feel like they've been saying ago. this for 20 years? No, no. I, I, I honestly <laughs> think in the last 10 years it, it's become palpable. And yeah. now you see yeah. people like I came in, um, you know, just came back from overseas and, and going through uh, customs. And at passport control, the guy starts, stops me and starts talking about going clear. I'm like, <laughs> wow. when, when would that have happened? That's you know, right. it's like people are now, like Michael says, people are engaged with nonfiction mm-hmm. in a way that they never were before. And I think part of that is that, you know, the people at, at this table have upped the game. In other words, yeah. they're right. making great films. And many, right. many others. I mean, right. Hundreds, and many, there are hundreds, yeah, there are thousands. great filmmakers yeah, a lot out of there great filmmaking. who are doing outstanding work. And formally innovative work so right. that you can't speak of them as uh, as one thing. Yeah. I think that's probably the most exciting part is that there's innovation and progress within the genre. Mm-hmm. And that is also because it is cheaper to make films and there are more people making films, which can create a pressure, but the progress is cool. Like and it, I, and it, I think it's the unpredictability. I yeah. really do. You, you sit down in front of a documentary, you don't know what you're going to yeah. get. Mm-hmm. There's all these different mm-hmm. attacks on it. You know, there's all these different things can happen narratively. And, and you can see the filmmaker being surprised as you watch it. And I think the audiences can feel that. Another issue that's very big at the moment within mainstream Hollywood is the lack of diversity and the lack of women filmmakers. I mean, documentaries seem to be one area where there's some kind of parody between absolutely, men and women. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Well, we're very why, proud of our, our documentary why, branch. Why is, yeah. yeah we, we have, why is that? We, uh, well... Um, Part of it is probably the money. And the cynical, I mean, no, the cynical the explanation cynical, is yeah. the bar, they're, they're lower budgets overall. Right. And lower so that's budgets, the thing. So it's, it's being opened to women, and yeah. we work for four years for one fee that's right. not enough to live for four right. years. And so, we're not I mean, financing within the studio. It's, we're doing so it's these great, but it's actually, I don't think this, the, the, the roots of the structure are, are the, the so right. So it's a reflection of the misogyny, is what you're saying. Slightly. Yeah, I'm just saying, I'm saying that, that, saying that, that the budgets are lower, we're right. paid less, and therefore. You know, and it's and it's true in independent film. We all know it. Like if you right. you're a female filmmaker and you right. launched your first indie mm-hmm. film at Sundance versus that mm-hmm. male filmmaker in two years he's making a studio movie. It takes her eleven years to get her next film made. Right. I made up those numbers. Don't quote right. me, but that's yeah, the yeah, yeah. experience. And then ours is of course more 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 open to women, but the budgets right. are much lower. Right. right. Something I noticed in um, making a film about a woman, and I've been saying this because mm-hmm. I get asked this question about the inequity of women and as, as filmmakers is I think that there is a lack of strong female. Uh, documentaries in terms of the character. Mm. And I think that that's Mm. something that I feel really personally responsible for. After making a film about a strong woman, I want to try to, and you went through (laughs) this as well. You've done a great job. But I mean, it's it's true, there really aren't that many documentaries about strong women or flawed women. Women who are challenging the system. That's interesting. I mean, we live in a society that's been historically sexist and there are fewer (laughs) women who are given those opportunities. I mean, people like Nina Simone and Janis Joplin played a huge price for their badass, you know, boundary busting Mm -hmm. uh, stances Mm -hmm. in their in their political moments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's not just historically sexist. It still is. I I mean, the the New York Times article a couple months ago 
2% of the top 100 grossing uh, 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 films, Hollywood films, uh -huh. are directed by women, mm -hmm. 2%. Mm -hmm. They're the majority gender. They're 51% of the population, right. and 2% and mm -hmm. of the storytelling done by Hollywood is done by the majority uh, gender. It's, it, I mean, it's just, it's really. But, and then also, but the Anthropologists also, aren't gonna understand this a few hundred years And also now, women are really going to the movies. Going. I mean, Pitch Perfect right. 2 Absolutely. was this huge box office success Absolutely. because it, it had strong female characters. I mean, interesting female characters and, and, and people went and it was a huge success. And so there's also the women in the audience who are, who are backing up the need for more of right. the stories. Absolutely. If you were to make one documentary about one woman, who would it be? This is like that Republican <laughs> debate, you know, who would you put on the, the dollar bill? Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> um, I was gonna say that. You were gonna Can say I? Margaret Thatcher? I was. Well, then Can you I? should do that. I was one. always fascinated by Gertrude Bell. Do you know who she yeah, is? Sure. Yeah, I thought, but then someone made a film about it recently. Um, I just thought her story, it must mm -hmm. have been, she must have had a fascinating mm -hmm. life. Lee Miller, I, I've mm. always been interested mm. in her, and I know that they just announced they're doing a fictional film, but I, I thought about it for many years. There's just not that much that exists on her, but I feel like she was such a ball buster. This? I mean, I'm so I'm so still entranced by Nina Simone. I, it's hard for me to think of who who I would do next. But um, I have one for you. Okay, who? Hedy Lamar. Oh, yeah. You know what's so funny? People on Facebook keep on like pinging me about <laughs> Hedy Lamar. Right. That wasn't you, was it? Or you. <laughs> I think you should explain why so that our audience knows. Uh, well, Hedy Lamar was an extraordinary person, who, uh, an actress who was famous for an early nude scene, but then was an inventor, a scientist, who ended up doing a lot of, I think, the code breaking right. for World War II. Mm -hmm. So an extraordinary person, who uh, a real polymath, who never got her due. And, yeah, she, and on her she, Wikipedia, it says actor scientist. So right. it's kind of when amazing. When you see that, actor scientist. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen my film, the one that's yeah. out right now? Mm -hmm. So this, it's this film. It's the, the thread through the film is that in those countries and those societies where women have real power. Oh, mm -hmm. women. Yeah, it's women. totally. Women. Yeah. 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 Not, not, not a single, women. Not a yeah. single right. anecdotal story, but yeah. women have real power. In those countries, everyone benefits. I had this kind of thought before I started mm -hmm. shooting, but, but halfway through it and going across these yeah. countries, it's just like we were just like saying, clearly there is a common That's right. denominator. Well, there have also been some women Dictators. There was Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. Oh, no, no. You know, no, I no, lived no, on no. the Thatcher. Well, again, if, if you see my film, great. if you see you, my you film, you should make that Thatcher life. film. No, 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 yeah. no, no. When it's just one woman, it's a token. When there's two women, it's a minority. When there's three women or more, now it's yes, the table yes. starts right. to look a little different That's as right. this table does. That's right. It gets better the more women are at the table. That's right. It, the, Hollywood will be better. The Catholic, um, the Catholic Church would be better. Yeah. Maybe right. the Pope should see uh, your film. <laughs> I would love for the Pope to see this film. I wonder if each of you could look back and uh, tell us, what's the strangest experience you encountered in the midst of making one of your films? Certainly for me, going into the Pentagon was very interesting. Huh. Um, I mean, there's, you know, you just, in, when you're in D.C., you, you know, you, you have shots in your film. Uh, you just see it as this edifice. And what was interesting, though, is what I learned was that um, they were as afraid of me as I was of them. Because if they made any mistake and I somehow made a film about it or did anything, you know, the publicity would be so bad on the, the individuals that were handling me or anything. So the first time I went in, I just thought, wow, this is quite an experience. The second time I realized, no, it's actually, there's a... There's an equivalent in our experience in this. I was in Pakistan and I was supposed to meet the Minister of Defense at the prison where all the Al-Qaeda members were being held. And I sat in that prison for three and a half hours and he never showed up and I was terrified. And I just remember thinking, what the hell am I doing here? But I mean, happens, happens, right? <laughs> I think it's got mostly to do with subjects, where you get to know someone very, very intimately over the, su not Meru. I mean, I've made five films before I made Meru, and most of them were political. And I think my first film, which was in Kosovo, um, I had an experience with a subject where you get to know them over four years of shooting a film. And then, you know, he, he, he was a refugee to the United States, and he had, he was actually accused of raping a student when he came to college here. Mm. And it was a very strange and difficult experience because you want someone to have representation, but it also changes how, changes your relationship and also how, like what is your responsibility here? Mm. Um, so that was a very deep and like mm. difficult and strange experience for me. Alex? Well, 
uh, I've also had strange experiences like Amy in terms of going to places like Afghanistan, but maybe the weirdest or strangest experience was interviewing the 22-year-old madam of the Empress Club, <laughs> realizing that this giggly woman before me who had in the palm of her hand some of the most powerful people in the country oh. who were her clients, and she's worried, you know, I think we should have thought about the cash in the safe. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a weird experience yeah. to enter that world and, and how explosive it was. Mm. It was a kind of hidden world. Mm -hmm. um, of the people in power that I hadn't really reckoned with until I met this 22-year-old woman. Michael, what, what, what's your oddest encounter? <laughs> We've seen My it on camera. <laughs> yeah, you've seen it. <laughs> it. It would take too long. To, I, I think the strangest, not an anecdote, but the strangest encounters with me in all my films have, have been the how many times I've discovered how wrong I was mm. while I was making the film. Mm -hmm. And, and that ha has happened each time in Sicko, about healthcare, mm -hmm. I thought I was gonna make a film about the 50 million people that didn't have health insurance. And the film became a film about the 200 million who do have health insurance, that, that they were in danger because these insurance companies have no intention of paying up when, if, when and if you really find yourself in a catastrophe. Mm -hmm. And that that became then the film. Or in Roger and Me, it wasn't a film about General Motors or Flint, Michigan. It, halfway through it, I realized this is a film about an economic system that's unjust and it's unfair and it's not democratic. And, and so each of those times that turn, I'm sure you guys have all had that experience, when that takes place, what you set out to do, and sometimes you do a 180 with it, and you're not upset that you, that you were wrong, you're so thrilled mm -hmm. by the fact that you've learned something. And Liz, how about you, some moment that jumps out from your career? Uh, one of my first films was The Farm in Gullah, USA, and it, I think, I'm sure we all relate to this, but when you go into a world that's very different from your own, sometimes you're very surprised by the rules and the laws and the norms, right, that you find. And we were shooting this um, parole board hearing of a man named Vincent Simmons who was on his 16th year of a life sentence for, for, for a rape, and he goes before the parole board. Their job is not to adjudicate innocence. Their job is to see is he reformed enough to, to leave the prison, which actually never happens. But in this case, he presented this exculpatory evidence of innocence, um, stuff that had never been shown at trial. And he walks, and it's this pa powerful, powerful moment where, you know, he's seen in the lineup, he's the only guy in the, hand, in the lineup who has handcuffs on his wrists, and that's where he's identified by the uh, victims of the crime. And he leaves the room. The men at the parole board hearing all ch chat with each other very quickly. They say, mm. well, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then they start saying things like, well, all black people look alike, and this is da, da, da. And they say these things, and we're shooting it, and we think, they're going to kick us at the f out of here. Like, we are not going to be able to put this on. They're going to not sign the releases. We're not going to get it, you know. And then and then they come back in. They deny yeah. his parole, and they sort of high-five each other. And we're thinking, how is this going to work? And then afterwards, they're like, that was so fun. Let's make a TV series <laughs> together. We could call it the parole board. Yeah. And so you're like, they're so within their normal, which is the mm -hmm. high-fiving, the yeah, all-blacks yeah. look-alike comment, that, they're, that the, the awareness that actually it was something that was shameful yeah. um, no. was not even part of it. They didn't think anything was wrong with They that. didn't think anything was wrong, no. and they signed their releases and pitched us a series. Mm -hmm. And that was when I realized something about being a documentary filmmaker, you know, that, that you drop those judgments, you know, because you're in with them, and you don't know what to expect. So and that's because that was their truth. That was yes. their truth. Their truth. Steve, is yes. that all black people look alike. So what's the responsibility there? Because that's a truth. And if you put them on a lie detector test, they would pass the test. Right. It, it's the age old question from Pontius Pilate, what is what truth? Is truth? Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we are always, all of us trying yeah. to get at in our own ways. Well, thank you all for helping us get a step close to that and taking part in Close Up with the Hollywood Reporter, the documentary filmmakers. Thank you. Thank you for thank having you. us. Cheers. 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 We're at the adult table. <laughs> for a short time. <laughs>